It was December 20th, 1936, in the late hours of the frigid Russian winter. But in Moscow, inside the Kremlin, there was warmth and celebration. Men dressed in military-style uniforms toasting and congratulating themselves. Shot glasses clinked together as they toasted. This gathering was dedicated to celebrating the foundation of the Cheka, the secret police, who, at this point, did not exist anymore. They'd since morphed into a new regime of terror and absolute control, called the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, simply known as the NKVD. Among the crowd was the Man of Steel himself, Joseph Vasaryanovich Stalin. It was clear he was the center of attention at this party. His sycophantic and terrified underlings greeted him one by one, so as not to crowd him. So others waited their turn. Among the guests was Nikolai Yezhov, the recently appointed head of the NKVD. His predecessor did not please Stalin, so he was removed and would be shot. Yezhov was a small man, only about five feet tall, but he commanded his own substantial orbit of terror as Stalin's architect of the Great Purge. Among the guests was a Hungarian named K.V. Pauker. Pauker started his career, of all things, as a barber and a valet for the Budapest Opera before 1914. After joining up with the Bolsheviks, Pauker worked his way to becoming the operations head of the NKVD. He carried with him the great responsibility of ensuring the personal safety of all Soviet party leaders. It is said Pauker was the first individual ever permitted to shave Comrade Stalin. Of course, sparing the dictator's signature, bristling mustache. Imagine that, holding a razor so close to the tyrant's neck. It would be so quick to alter the course of history and maybe spare countless lives, but you would sure be instantly killed in this sea of sharks. Despite these responsibilities, Pauker was regarded as an idiot and a jokester, a funny man. Tipsy and ready to entertain Stalin, Pauker played out a dark comedy. He and two NKVD men acted out the final moments of a former comrade, Gregory Zinoviev. <laughs> Pauker, pretending to be Zinoviev, was dragged by the two agents to the middle of the floor. Everyone in the room was having a good laugh. Pauker moaned and rolled around, kicking and screaming. At one point, he got on his knees to beg for his life. He hugged the black boot of one of the NKVD agents. Please, Parker performed. The drunken crowd pointed and laughed. For God's sake, comrade, call Joseph Vasaryanovich. Parker continued to pretend to sob and whine while trying to hold back his own laughter. He broke character a few times, failing to contain his own outbursts at this ridiculous performance of piddling Zinovia. Please don't kill me, he bellowed. Call Joseph Vasaryanovich. An accompanying NKVD agent pretended to draw his pistol and made a finger gun at Pauker. Pauker's eyes lit up with pretend fear and fake tears. Bang! yelled the guard. Pauker fell back. The crowd erupted. They demanded he perform Zinoviev's death again. In this next version, Pauker decided to mock Zinoviev's Jewish heritage. Ironically, Pauker himself was Jewish. But like a good Soviet was ideologically atheist. Again, the NKVD agents dragged Pauker to the middle of the room, his feet trailing behind him. They let him go. Pauker raised his hands up and yelled, Here, Israel, our God is the only God. <laughs> Stalin nearly spat out his vodka at this apparent golden comedy. <laughs> He couldn't contain himself, bent forward, and clutched his gut with both arms. He waved at Pauker to stop, otherwise he might have died of laughter. Ironically, Pauker, Zinoviev, and nearly everybody in this room would soon become victim of Stalin's great terror and perish themselves in a similar manner to their fallen comrade whom they mocked. Even more so, this blatant display of anti-Semitism highlighted Stalin's personal prejudice against Jewish people even if they served in his government. In the coming months and years, Stalin would flex his methodical and calculating cunning to remove his rivals, initiate collectivization and industrialization, and solidify absolute power, so much so, he would control life and death 
of Soviet citizens for nearly three decades. And this was possible largely thanks to Stalin's secret police, the NKVD. Stalin's ice-cold approach to dealing with his rivals, colleagues, friends, and family was a level of chilling indifference that no Russian winter ever rivaled. This episode was a doozy, and I know this because what I'm telling you right now was the very last thing that I wrote. It was a doozy because the NKVD existed during a period of immense change in Russia. Sure, Lenin started the revolution and successfully saw it through, but he didn't live long enough to build the Soviet Union in his image. That job would be left up to Joseph Stalin. Stalin took an infant Soviet Union and made it grow up into a rival superpower to the United States. If you think about it, this is a monumental achievement. Stalin took an agrarian nation and transformed it into a spacefaring nuclear power. How? Stalin recognized the need for rapid industrialization and state control of the food supply, or collectivization. The USSR wasn't the only nation to rapidly industrialize in the 20th century. Japan is a, another good example of that. The human cost, however, was immense, estimated to be in the millions of deaths of Soviet peoples in Russia and the Soviet republics. Fear and terror would drive Stalin's five-year plans and quotas to achieve the industrial capacity necessary to fight a world war, go to space, and obtain nuclear bombs. The early USSR owes many of its achievements to the secret police called the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, or the NKVD. These guys really took Russian espionage to a new level. The third section on the Okhrana before it had some international reach, but the NKVD's reach was global in scale. Nearly anybody Stalin wanted dead, the NKVD could get it done. They administered the infamous gulags and repressed their own people. They blurred the lines between internal police and military force, having supported leftists during the Spanish Civil War. The NKVD was a secret police force dictators dream of vast, pervasive, feared, deadly, deceptive. Stalin knew, however, that whoever ran the NKVD shouldn't get too big for their boots because he had two of three of his chiefs executed. Now, if you've been following this show, I have said more than once that this Russia series would be six episodes. And, of course, I'm eating those words now. Because in the course of my research and writing this episode, there was so much to cover with the level of detail that I'm satisfied with that this could have easily been a four-hour episode. I personally do not have the stamina for that, uh, so I broke it into two separate episodes on the NKVD. This one will explore the NKVD's early years under the direction of Yagoda and Yezhov. This begs the question of how I'm handling the KGB, to which I say I haven't figured that out yet. Now, later we will explore the NKVD under the direction of one of history's most vile human beings, Lavrenti Beria, as well as the NKVD's involvement in the Second World War. You'll have to excuse the interval between episodes. Being a dad is a lot of work. The house is a constant project. We got a puppy. And uh, there's just a lot of other things going on. Look, there's only so much time in a day, and a hundred healthy, happy human years are no guarantee. So I like to try to do other things with my life. Uh, But to my listeners, thank you for your patience and uh, continuing to listen, like the show, rate it, review it, and subscribe. This has really been quite an incredible journey. And on another note of the delay here, um, this is the second time I'm going through this whole entire uh, show because I did almost get done with at least recording this and then um, my uh, preferred uh, recording software I decided to um, get rid of my file. It's out there somewhere in the ether and uh, unretrievable. So I had to do this again. If you follow me on Twitter and Instagram, you you probably saw me complaining about that. But here we are. We're starting over. We're going to do this again, and we're going to do it right. And I'll get it out of the way right now. This is a show about secret police, so violence and uncomfortable subjects and gruesome details are par for the course. Don't at me saying you let your elementary schooler listen to this for a history project and now they're having nightmares. I take no responsibility for that. 
I do, however, take responsibility for the uh, vodka I'll be consuming through this uh, episode. And actually, I finished the vodka uh, on my first recording that got lost. So actually, I have a, I have a, um, a glass of wine next to me this time. Whatever the drink, alcohol is the only way uh, to get by reading such gruesome things uh, late at night. You still got your winter gear from last time? Good, because we're still in Russia. In this fourth installment of Russian Secret Police, we are going to explore the inception of Stalin's Secret Police, the NKVD, as well as its leaders, its operations, and the atrocities they committed. We will also look at how a relatively new nation, the Soviet Union, continued down a path of terror and tyranny. How did Stalin obtain such power? Who were the men inside the NKVD? What were the real conditions in the Gulags? You're listening to the Secret Police Podcast. Do you have a problem with authority? Because I do. And I'm on a mission to help us build a healthy skepticism towards those in power. My name is Jack, and I spend hours researching and engaging with my morbid curiosity of dictatorships and share with you the history and methods of the world's most brutal secret police forces. From the KGB to the Gestapo, we look at how secret police enforce tyranny and strike fear in their people. We'll start off with recapping what we learned in part three. So the Russian people were frustrated with the Tsar and the Romanov dynasty. In 1917, Russia experienced two revolutions. First, Tsar Nicholas II abdicated the throne, and the provisional government took charge of Russia's many, many internal and external issues. Second, the Bolsheviks overthrew the provisional government and seized power in the October Revolution of that same year. The Tsar terrorized Russians inside and outside the country with his secret police, the Okhrana. Then, the following provisional government had spy agencies focused on counterintelligence against the Germans in the First World War, but they employed little to no domestic surveillance. The Bolsheviks would not be so generous. At first, Lenin himself said that his revolution would carry on without mass terror. That was characteristic of other revolutions in the West, such as the French Revolution. Unfortunately, Lenin did not keep his promise. A new secret police called the Cheka was created and led by Felix Dzerzhinsky. The Cheka imposed mass terror and downright horror upon the Russian people. The Cheka was disbanded in 1922 and promptly replaced with the GPU, then followed by the OGPU. Lenin died in 1924 and Stalin unexpectedly took power. But as we will learn, Stalin's ascension to power was predictable when you look at who Stalin was as a person, and when you look at the job bestowed upon him in the Communist Party. His seizure of power may have been unexpected at the time, but he was well positioned to become a dictator. Finally, we learned that each iteration of the Soviet secret police could be seen as a rebranding and reorganization of the OG cops, the Cheka. The current Russian FSB can be viewed as a modern iteration of the Cheka despite obviously not being technically Soviet secret police, but in my opinion, they're cut from the same cloth. The Russian government today celebrates its spies in the Day of National Security Services Officers on December 20th, the same day that the Cheka was formed in 1917. We left off with Stalin's rise to power last time, but Stalin lived quite an interesting life before taking the Soviet throne. However, before getting into Stalin's biography, we should talk about a topic that might be admittedly kind of dry, and that is a general overview of how the Soviet government was structured. I struggled to figure out exactly where to put this particular segment of information, and I again, I know it sounds boring, but trust me, understanding this better uh, will explain how Stalin became so powerful, how the Soviet uh, republics worked, and contextualized terms like um, Central Committee or Politburo. (music) 
The Soviet Union was an economic and political union of countries. We can distinguish between the powers of the republic governments like Ukraine, Armenia, or Georgia, for example, and the powers of the central government in Moscow. I'll probably make some comparisons to the U.S. government because I live in the States and, and our government structure is the one I'm obviously most familiar with. Sorry to my international audience. So with the republic government, citizens of these countries could join a local workers' council or Soviet. These workers' councils were scattered throughout the regions of each Soviet state. Each council selected delegates to join the main legislative body, which was a Congress of Soviets. For example, if you were a Russian delegate to uh, this Congress, you um, joined the All-Russian Congress of Soviets. If you were Ukrainian, you joined the All-Ukrainian Congress of Soviets. If you were Armenian, the All-Armenian Congress of Soviets. You get it. The title depended on the country it governed. Congress had several duties, like creating new laws, for example. They selected a council of ministers who were responsible for enforcing laws. Uh, they conducted trade, finance, and internal affairs like healthcare, agriculture, um, etc. An interesting detail here is Moscow largely had little influence on these tasks, like uh, at least on an individual republic level, uh, because Moscow delegated power to the republics to sort of deal with their own regional needs and nuances. It was sort of an attempt at decentralization. A representative state's Congress of Soviets also selected judges for terms of five years for the high court to interpret the laws. The Soviet Congress had an interesting aspect very different from the United States Congress. Soviet Congress met infrequently. Somebody had to be in charge in the interim while Congress was not in session. Therefore, Congress elected members to a central executive committee to govern until Congress met sometime in the future. They shared more or less the same powers as the Congress. At first glance, this seems to be a representative system, but there isn't much direct democracy going on here. Now, how can a system be representative without having democracy? The short answer is there was only one party, the Bolsheviks. The citizens of each Soviet state had to join a Soviet if they wanted to participate in politics, at least until 1937, but we'll talk about that in a second. Soviets, in theory, were made of or represented working class citizens, and the system, in theory, elevated working class people into positions of power. But one party was kind of the point, because when the workers had power, they achieved Marx's goal of a dictatorship of the proletariat. No competition with other political parties ensured a proletariat Bolshevik monopoly on power. Now let's look at the central government in Moscow. There is quite a similar structure here. Workers joined local Soviets. Soviets elected delegates to the All-Union Congress of Soviets, which amended the Soviet Constitution, admitted new republics, enacted five-year economic plans, and created new laws. Similar to Congress in the Soviet republics, the All-Union Congress selected judges for five-year terms and selected members of the more powerful All-Union Central Executive Committee, sometimes called the Politburo. The Politburo then could, one, select the ministers tasked with managing the USSR's affairs, and two, select the members of the Council of People's Commissars, the most powerful governing body of which Lenin himself was chairman. Today, we recognize Lenin and Stalin as heads of state of the Soviet Union, but technically neither were officially nor legally a head of state, but they were undoubtedly in charge. On that note, Stalin's eventual position of general secretary was a party position and not a government position. We'll get into the details of that uh, as well. By the way, a commissar is just an official in the Communist Party. That's all that word means. Everybody got that? I'm about to slap down another level of confusion. Stalin changed some of this structure in 1937. Surprise, surprise. Stalin abolished the Central Government's Congress in 1937 and replaced it with the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics. It's a mouthful. Like Congress before it, this body had the authority to make laws, appoint committee members, amend the constitution, etc. They could also bypass any democratic process by enacting decrees similar to U.S. presidential executive orders, but it would be like if Congress initiated executive orders. 
the Supreme Soviet of the USSR had two chambers. The Soviet of the Union, those members were directly elected by Soviet citizens. And the second chamber was the Soviet of Nationalities, which had 32 total deputies representing the Soviet republics. On a regional level, legislatures were renamed the Supreme Soviets of whatever nation they were in. Additionally, the Soviet workers' councils were abolished in favor of direct election to the Supreme Soviet. Regional governments also changed the name of their Council of Ministers to the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet. Again, the central government system seems representative and democratic, but the Bolshevik party was the only option. Why were these changes made? Because a problem Stalin faced was representation. The Soviet Union and modern-day Russia is actually a highly diverse society, especially the Soviet Union since it included the smaller republics with distinct cultures. These structural changes attempted to increase representation of minority groups. However, before 1937, anybody could join a Soviet and influence the demographic makeup of Congress. Most of the voters were Russian. Therefore, most of the Soviet Union's representatives were Russian. It was more like proportional representation rather than equal representation. So for example, if you have a 100-person Congress with proportional representation and you have 50 Russians, 20 Georgians, 20 Ukrainians, and 10 Latvians, the Russians will always carry more weight and power so long as proportional representation exists because Russians would carry 50% of the vote every time in my little example here. And I know math doesn't really translate well to podcast format, but I did it anyway because I'm the worst. It seems like a half-assed attempt at representing the USSR's groups of uh, people who were not Russians. And it's my opinion that Stalin wasn't really interested in minority representation. Overall, Soviet citizens participated in two elections, one for their Soviet Republic's Congress and a second for the Congress of the Central Government. Now, with that out of the way, let's move on to Stalin's life and how he went from a Georgian nobody to arguably one of, if not the, most powerful person on Earth for a period. <laughs> On December the 18th, 1878, Joseph Vissarionovich Jugashvili was born in the small town of Gori in Georgia. Georgia is a small country in the Caucasus that borders Russia, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and the Black Sea. At the time of Joseph's birth, Georgia was part of the Russian Empire, so despite being ethnically Georgian, he would go on to learn to speak Russian by age nine. His parents were Bessarian and Ekaterina Jugashvili. They went by Beso and KK, respectively. And Joseph's childhood name was Soso. Beso and KK had two other children before Joseph, but tragically both died in infancy at under a year old. Joseph was obviously their only surviving child. And I read that KK doted over young Joseph. What mother wouldn't be uh, given that kind of experience with motherhood. But young Joseph was not a well child, having struggled with several quite serious medical conditions. When he was seven years old, Joseph was stricken with smallpox, a virus that was one of the most deadly infectious diseases, especially at that time. Smallpox was and is highly contagious and causes fever and a distinctive rash that resembles tiny pustules. Smallpox can kill about 30% of those infected and perhaps more back then. For comparison, COVID's mortality rate, I think even at the beginning of the pandemic, just in the United States, uh, again, I, I think, was uh, under 5%. And of course, at the beginning of the pandemic, we did not have a vaccine to further reduce the risk of death. So smallpox was a very deadly disease, especially for a child in the late 19th century. Young Joseph was one of the lucky ones, but he was 
permanently scarred by what were often described as pock marks left behind from the smallpox rash. When Joseph was 12 years old, he was maybe hit by a horse-drawn carriage, which permanently disabled his left arm and would remain shorter than his right arm for the rest of his life. Future photographs of the dictator often show him hiding his left arm as not to draw attention to his disfigurement. I did read, however, that Joseph's short left arm actually may not have resulted from the carriage accident, but rather a genetic abnormality. So there's an alternative explanation, perhaps. Despite these challenges, young Joseph had a modest life. His father, Beso, was a successful cobbler or shoemaker and even had his own employees. But the Jugashvili's lived at or below their means with the occasional special staple in their kitchen like butter, which was considered a luxury at that time. Young Joseph was not in a privileged household like that of Lenin, though. The Jugashvili's did not share similar wealth or political connection to the Tsar's government like that of the Ulyanovs, but they weren't completely impoverished either. Young Joseph's background really was probably the most proletariat among his future colleagues in Lenin's inner circle. The family shoe business was not always prosperous, which contributed to Beso's drinking and violent alcoholism. It's common knowledge among both scholars and curious observers of Stalin that young Joseph was beaten savagely by his father. Yes, this probably imprinted psychological trauma and obviously resulted in physical trauma. That kind of violent behavior from, from a parent onto a child would, I think, negatively impact most children, but I'm not an expert on such matters. It just seems obvious to me that, it, you know, that it, that kind of treatment would. But as the historian Stephen Kotkin has pointed out, contrary to lay people's belief, it's unlikely young Joseph's beatings turned him into an evil person. One must consider that at that time, it wasn't unusual to beat children. But not all of those children grew up to become mass murderers. Just speculating here. Maybe the beatings that young Joseph received normalized violence at a young age, but it's important to me to point out that the beatings were probably not the single turning point that transformed young Joseph into a personification of evil. Back to Beso for a moment. In addition to his failing business, Beso was plagued by rumors that one of the local Orthodox priests was young Joseph's real father. Such rumors only served to fuel Beso's rage and abuse of young Joseph. I personally do not buy these rumors because photos of Beso look too much like the adult Stalin. To me, based on those photos alone, Beso was Joseph's real dad. Young Joseph at 15 would enter the Tiflis Theological Seminary at the urging of his mother because she wanted him to become a priest. Tiflis was the Georgian capital city before it was renamed Tbilisi in 1936. Joseph was a highly capable student but a troublemaker, and it's in these years at seminary that Joseph started forming into the man that he would become. First, he became a revolutionary. He read books by the likes of Karl Marx, Nikolai Chernyshevsky, and Alexander Kezbegi. These writers influenced Joseph's affinity for communism and disdain for the Tsarist Empire. Meanwhile, his Bible merely collected dust. Joseph adopted the name Koba, which comes from the main character in Alexander Kezbegi's novel The Patricide. In this book, which I haven't read because apparently it's actually quite rare, Koba is a Georgian folk hero. So young Joseph viewed Koba as a perfect pseudonym for his revolutionary writings. In later years, Joseph opted for the name Stalin, which roughly translates to steel or man of steel. Joseph spent six years in seminary until he was expelled for reading Marx. He then rejected the church, became an atheist, and joined the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, or the RSDLP. But the guy had to eat, right? The Khachapuri wasn't going to eat itself. Joseph got a job as a clerk at the Tiflis Meteorological Observatory. In his spare time, Joseph beefed up his skills as a revolutionary and as an agitator. He organized labor strikes, wrote socialist articles, and exercised his modest skill as a speaker. In 1901, Joseph was tasked by the RSDLP to organize a labor strike at an oil refinery in the Georgian coastal town of Batumi. 
Joseph was caught, arrested, and sentenced to 18 months in prison. After his prison stint, Joseph was exiled to Siberia. But Joseph had a knack for escaping. More on that soon. In 1906, Joseph met his first wife, Keto Svanitsa. And they had sexy time. Stuff you don't want to imagine Stalin doing. They had their first and only son, Yakov, born the following year. Family life was difficult. Joseph was busy with his revolutionary activities, so Keto and Yakov didn't see much of him. Also, Joseph would be arrested and sent to Siberia no less than six times within a 12-year period. Each time, he escaped and traveled back to the western part of the Russian Empire using forged documents. I mentioned briefly in part two that rumors persisted that Stalin may have been an agent of the Tsarist's secret police, the Okhrana, because he uh, escaped with ease from Siberian camps past checkpoints unscathed and seemed to travel with ease. Now, the two things we discussed were one, Siberian camps during the Tsarist era were uncomfortable, but not nearly the horror show they would become under Lenin and Stalin. And number two, no records were ever discovered uh, indicating Stalin was an Okhrana agent, but historian Ronald Hingley pointed out that it would be unlikely that Stalin never used the Okhrana in some way to his advantage. The man and the secret police would have had much to gain from each other's cooperation. Anyway, if you haven't stopped by part two, I encourage you to do so. In December 1907, Joseph experienced one of the worst life-altering events a person can have, the loss of his partner, his spouse, the mother of his son. Cato died of typhus when she was just 22 years old. In later writings, Stalin gave a chilling recount of his feelings upon the passing of his beloved Cato. He wrote, quote, This creature softened my heart of stone. She has died. And with her have died my last warm feelings for humanity. End quote. Personally, I can't say that I wouldn't feel the same if something happened to my beloved, but it's interesting that Stalin's feelings towards humanity sour and not his feelings towards an infectious disease like typhus. The final time Stalin was arrested was in February 1913, and he was exiled to Turkhansk, far away from civilization in the unforgiving wilderness. Like, the nearest major city to this place in Russia is Tomsk, and even that's 650 miles or 1,040 kilometers south of where Joseph was sent. He spent four years in the middle of nowhere, and his experience in that camp is said to have hardened him. The Joseph who entered that camp was not the same Joseph who exited. So with Cato dead and Joseph frolicking in the woods, where was little Yakov during this time? Well, he was raised by Cato's parents, and Joseph would uh, ignore and neglect his son. Yakov would meet a grim fate during the Second World War, but that's for a later episode. However, prior to Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union, Stalin would make his feelings towards Cato's family abundantly clear. In part two, we briefly talked about political disagreements within the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party that caused the party to split into the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. Joseph had read and admired Vladimir Lenin's work, and he aligned himself with the Bolshevik faction. Joseph immediately went to work for the party. One of the many things you will read about Stalin that is consistent across multiple sources is that he was an incredibly hard worker. The man could grind and hustle. He proved himself to be useful to Lenin and the Bolsheviks by robbing banks and committing other crimes to collect cash funds for the Bolsheviks. For Lenin, Joseph was proving himself to have some real Bolshevik balls, a pair of budding tyrannical testicles, if you will. He was an effective yes-man. Lenin referred to him as, quote, the wonderful Georgian. Joseph was so wonderful in Lenin's eyes that he was given a party position in the Bolshevik Central Committee, a key decision-making apparatus of the party. Joseph gave himself a title promotion, too, by exchanging the old pseudonym Koba for Stalin, which is what I will refer to him as for the rest of this series. One thing I noticed about Stalin between his exile and his joining of the Bolsheviks is that he cleaned himself up well. Looking at photos of 
him as a young man in exile. He looks scraggly and unkempt, but when he joins the Bolsheviks, there was a, a clear transformation to a pristine and, and clean Stalin. I guess people don't shower much in exile. Go figure. So, for example, during his time in Siberia, he sported a beard. Uh, granted, it is cold out there, so probably helped with insulating your face. But when he joined the party, it it was like he hit the gym, uh, shaved down to the stash, and cleaned out all the dirty dishes from his bedroom. So if Stalin can do this, then maybe even you can get your act together. Now, recall from episode two that Tsar Nicholas II had a lot of issues, one of which was being unpopular. He lost a war with Japan at the beginning of the century, many millions died on his watch due to a famine, and his personal life behind the palace walls was subject to much negative speculation. Really, calling him unpopular was generous. World War I was a temporary cooling of tensions between the Tsar's government and the revolutionaries. But as the Russian army's performance in the war stalled, Nicholas's legitimacy as a leader was recalled into question. I've referred to part two a few times now, uh, so if you haven't listened to the Okrana episode yet, I, I encourage you to, to do so. The, that episode is actually the most accessible since it's the least violent, in my opinion. But hey, this is a show about secret police, so, so you know what you're signing up for when you press play. So in March 1917, Nicholas II abdicated the throne and power was shifted to the provisional government. Where was Stalin during all this? Well, he was still in Siberia. Remember, he was arrested in February 1913, and he was sentenced to four years. What I don't know is how his release occurred on an administrative level because the Tsarist government that exiled him was no longer in existence after 1917. Eventually, Stalin returned to the capital city, Petrograd, to support his comrades in the Petrograd Soviet who shared power with the provisional government. However, the Petrograd Soviet was more of a competing sphere of power. Stalin became the editor of the Soviet newspaper, Pravda, which means truth in English. Lenin was not happy with the provisional government, and the feeling was mutual. The government leader, Alexander Kerensky, suspected Lenin was actually a German spy and banned the Bolshevik party. Lenin felt hurt and sad, feeling the sting of 20th century cancel culture. Stalin helped Lenin escape to Finland, but in October 1917, Lenin sensed a disturbance in the force, which was that the very real opportunity to seize power had presented itself. Lenin returned to Petrograd and did exactly that, seizing power for himself and the Bolsheviks. What followed was the colossal cluster of the Russian Civil War that drew in international participation. Stalin was appointed to the position of political commissar. His job was to defend the city of Tsaritsyn, which sat on the Volga River in the southern part of Soviet-controlled territory. However, Stalin had to take orders from his military superior and arch-nemesis, Leon Trotsky. Stalin was unhappy with this arrangement, but he would deal with Trotsky later. Despite this friction with Trotsky, Stalin and the army he commanded were successful in defending the city. Tsaritsyn was renamed Stalingrad in his honor in 1925. And during the Civil War, the Bolsheviks officially became the Russian Communist Party. Here is where we arrive at sort of a crossroads between the youth and early achievements of Stalin and his rise to power and subsequent career. This is certainly not meant to be an exhaustive biography of Stalin whatsoever. There's a lot of detail I skipped over. If you are interested in learning more about Stalin, I would read one of my major sources, Stephen Kotkin's Stalin Paradoxes of Power, or listen to one of my favorite podcasts, The Eastern Border. He has a series called The Man of Steel that is, I think, at least 10 episodes now. Uh, they're each a deep dive on Stalin's life. Uh, however, currently... Um, that series is not complete because of the war in Ukraine. But uh, the Eastern Border is well worth a listen if you're interested in Eastern Europe in general. And I will have a link in the episode description or the show notes for this, of course. Now, Stalin would go to work for the Communist Party with unmatched grind and hustle. Quite frankly, they needed his organizational skills and cunning for the party apparatus to be truly successful. 
Now, I should point out that despite his skill, Stalin was viewed by the elites in the Communist Party, such as Trotsky, as a mediocrity, an unintelligent simpleton. This is partly because Stalin didn't come from an elite background and wasn't ethnically Russian. He learned to speak Russian at a young age, but through his whole life, he never lost his Georgian accent. Now, given that I get tongue-tied and mix words up when speaking English, I won't even attempt Russian with a Georgian accent. But this is something that Kristaps over at the Eastern Border Podcast demonstrates if you are into such linguistic acrobatics. Stalin's colleagues underestimated him for his otherness and lack of education to the detriment of many. Stalin may not have been an intellectual or an early communist thought leader, but he was smart, smart enough to have the elites picked off and shot. Big brain didn't really help them there. Trotsky referred to Stalin as, quote, an outstanding mediocrity of the party, end quote. Lev Kemenev said Stalin was a small-town politician. Stalin had not yet been granted the party position that would set him up for dictatorship. Yakov Sverdlov was the Bolsheviks' original lead administrator. Sverdlov was an impressive figure, too, since he and six of his staff members grew party membership from 600 in 1917 to about 8,000 in 1919. Sverdlov did this while also being the chairman of the Soviet Central Executive Committee. Sverdlov died in 1919 at just 33 years old, and Lenin didn't know if the position could be filled by an equally competent individual. Yelena Stasova stepped into the lead administrator role, but only lasted a few months before leaving due to the workload. She was replaced by Nikolai Krestinsky, who was a graduate of the law faculty at St. Petersburg University and the Commissar for Finance. Krestinsky also served on both the Politburo and the Org Bureau, two positions he retained while also taking on the responsibilities of lead administrator. Uh, and just a side note, what were the Politburo and the Org Bureau? Well, we covered the structure of the Soviet government, but just for extra detail, the Politburo was a committee concerned with overall strategy of the and uh, direction of the country, whereas the Org Bureau was a committee tasked with the more practical matters like operations and staffing. Despite Krestinsky's level of education and supposedly good memory, Krestinsky was overwhelmed by the position. Lead administrator turned out to be a cursed job, cursed with high turnover, that is. In 1920, Leonid Serebrakov and Yevgeny Priobrzezinski were added to Krestinsky's staff to help alleviate the workload. Not even the three of these clowns could do the job. Work went unfinished and complaints piled up within the party. For example, files went unread and it seemed like the three of these men were, were paralyzed by internal squabbles over power. Not to mention, Krestinsky himself had complaints about his work as finance commissar. Lenin soon made sure that the three stooges were stripped of their party positions and could never be re-elected to committee assignments again. Lenin then appointed maybe a familiar person to the brutal secretary role, Vyacheslav Molotov. He was assigned two staff members, Yamolyan Yaroslavsky and Vasily Mikhailov. Can you guess what happened to these two? They both left their positions. As the historian Stephen Kotkin describes the lead administrator position, quote, the hours were long and the work tough. The secretariat was besieged with both reports of functionaries, drunkenness, bribe-taking, and political illiteracy, and requests to supply competent cadres while appointees or Prospective appointees showed up in droves looking for guidance, permissions, or favors, end quote. In a way, the Communist Party's structure and Stalin's personality complemented each other perfectly. Centralized appointments, secrecy, information control, personal control, etc. He remembered names and personal details about the people he met and worked with, even the Kremlin's janitor, a person's Status didn't matter to Stalin in the proletarian pecking order. He paid close attention to people. He was talented in organization, had a keen strategic mind, and most importantly, he was a workhorse. Like I said, the guy was a hard worker. 
And if I could go on a quick tangent, guys, it is so important to have a strong work ethic, to have a, a beast mode hustle and grit, because in my experience, 80% of the things that I have accomplished have been accomplished through hard work, and probably only about 20% of that uh, came from just intelligence. And I personally don't think I'm that gifted in the brain department, or at least I am hyper aware of my intellectual limits. Tangent over. We just learned that many people couldn't shake it in the lead administrative position. So Lenin eventually appointed Stalin to this position, the position of general secretary of the communist party. Technically, this wasn't a government position. It was a party position. But what is remarkable is Stalin was virtually handed a position with a high potential for dictatorship. I bet the previous people kicked themselves over such a missed opportunity once they realized the powerful Stalin took their job. Let's explore how this was even possible. Stalin started as general secretary in April of 1922, and immediately had both considerable responsibility and power. But how much power did Stalin really have? Well, the party apparatus numbered approximately 600 people, according to Stephen Kotkin. Two years before, the total was only 30 people. So you can see significant uh, membership growth there. The party was important. In fact, it was the critical institution meant to overshadow all others in the Soviet Union. Stalin sought to drastically expand the party apparatus. After all, it was in the general secretary's job description to hire people even adding to his own personal staff. This is an aspect of Stalin's work that I've encountered multiple times. That because he was in charge of hiring new party members, Stalin recruited only those who could remain loyal to him. After all, Stalin did provide them with a job. That's party status, income, and perks. What he got in return was loyalty and power. He hired young people who were itching to make an impact on their nation. And many of these newbies were brought in from far away provinces. He required new appointees to send him frequent reports on party organizations scattered around the vastness of the Soviet territories. What's critical is that the general secretary was a position that spanned the entire party apparatus, meaning Stalin could appoint his loyalists to any position at any facet of the party. Stalin was a critical junction in this machine. He would have had to either show zero ambition or immense self-discipline to not build a dictatorship. Yet his competence yielded tangible results. The disorganization and mismanagement characteristic of the previous lead administrators disappeared. Stalin cracked skulls and installed order. He was good at getting the party's bureaucratic machine working. He made the Central Committee get its act together. It's said that Stalin loved his job. Work was his Viagra, and he left the office every day sporting a strong Soviet stiffy. Above loving his job, he did one very important thing his predecessors did not. He actually did his job. Maintaining control was key to building a dictatorship. Early in Stalin's career, he exerted authority via the NKVD who planted agents within the party within the police and within the military, like the Cheka had before it, because it is important to carry the support of the guys with guns. A general staff officer noted that, quote, he accumulated power because of his strength of will, patience, slyness, ability to perceive human frailties and play upon them with contempt, and the supreme gift of pursuing a chosen goal inflexibly and without scruple, end quote. I know this sounds like an awful lot of praise, but don't worry, guys, I, I know Stalin was a terrible person. In the spring of 1923, Stalin's vast powers actually came under scrutiny. In fact, it appeared Lenin wanted Stalin removed from the party altogether. Okay, but why? Did Lenin see the mistake in handing a personality like Stalin's such a powerful position? Or was there some conspiracy at play? Or did Stalin make a mistake? Maybe a little bit of all three. A year before, Stalin proposed the Russian Soviet Federated Socialist Republic, or the RSFSR, absorb the other socialist republics, which was an appealing prospect for the party. 
The idea, among other things, was meant to unify foreign affairs, military operations, and economic planning under one nation. The RSFSR first absorbed Ukraine, Belarus, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. Uh, did these smaller nations agree to such an agreement willingly? Yes and no. Azerbaijan saw this as a favorable arrangement to avoid uh, Iranian influence, and Armenia was wary of Turkey considering the relative freshness of the Armenian genocide. Lenin appears to have had mixed feelings about this, and he didn't like the wording of the strategy. Rather than Russia absorbing smaller nations, they should be willingly joining forces with Russia. One country in the Caucasus that didn't seem too interested in uh, such an arrangement was Stalin's home nation of Georgia. I'll give a brief overview, but stay in my lane as not to encroach on Roberto's History of Suckett Villa Georgia podcast. Uh, go check it out if you haven't already. Uh, all about Georgia over there. Great podcast. Uh, Stalin suspected the Georgian communists intended to seek independence. Evidence of this came across Stalin in the form of, of written defiance toward Moscow's rule from individuals within Georgia's government. Other nation central committees took issue with Georgia's admittance to the USSR as well. It appeared the idea of Federated states in Europe and Asia faced not insignificant challenges. In 1921, a chap named Sergo or Jana Kadiza initiated the formation of a federation of the South Caucasus. Unfortunately, this sparked a heaping spoonful of racism as Armenians were forced from Tbilisi and the Georgian Council of People's Commissars decreed that citizenship into Soviet Georgia would be based in part on ethnicity. Boy, howdy, like we haven't heard stuff like that before. Sergo Orjana Kadidza is somebody worth taking a brief detour to talk about. Born in 1886 in Georgia to a well-to-do family, Orjana Kadidza first pursued a career in medicine. In 1903, he qualified as a medical uh, orderly at the same time as he joined the Bolsheviks. Uh, now, he met Stalin in prison in Baku in Azerbaijan, and they became uh, decent pals, at least as good of pals as one could be with Stalin. In 1920, Stalin and Ordjana Kadidza captured Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia by military force. Orjana Kadiza went on to serve in different uh, party positions in the People's Commissars. And his uh, name is quite fun to say once you, get the, once you get the hang of it. So let's go back to the question, why was Stalin's power now in jeopardy? Because Stalin was having a difficult time cobbling together this Eurasian superstate, perhaps he'd bit off more than his mustache could chew. But questions against Stalin's power were far from finished, and these uh, criticisms coincided with Lenin's failing health. By October 1922, Lenin had suffered at least one stroke. One doctor wrote, quote, He is having paralytic attacks every day. Vladimir Ilyich is upset and worried by the deterioration in his condition, end quote. Lenin had to take time off of work and step away from the stress of running a more or less brand new country, but his condition continued to decline. His motor skills such as writing were deteriorating so much so that he couldn't even touch a pen to the tip of his nose or lip. I often have quite a lot of sympathy for people suffering a slow death by a medical condition, but uh, Lennon, honestly, ugh. He is a difficult person to feel sorry for. Go back and listen to part three about the horrors the Cheka committed on his watch, and you'll see what I mean. Lenin's doctors ordered him to step away from his duties in order to reduce stress. This meant more tasks were delegated to his inner circle, such as Stalin. Time and communication with Lenin was also coveted, and Stalin sought to control access to Lenin. 
December 22nd, 1922, Lenin asks Stalin for cyanide. But that night, Lenin also suffered a second stroke that paralyzed the right side of his body. He was also becoming increasingly worried. He uh, would not be able to fall asleep since Lenin was experiencing some, some serious insomnia. March 1923. Lenin suffered a third stroke. The great orator and conjurer of the Russian Revolution was rendered unable to speak. Neurologist Professor Kramer wrote in his journal that, quote, Lenin kept trying to say something, but only quiet, disjointed sounds emerged, end quote. Lenin's inevitable death spurred concerns among officials about anti-Soviet uprisings across the USSR. The OGPU secret police, talked about them in part three, made preparations for such chaos to explode in the Soviet Union. Here's where Stalin's power is again put into question. May 1923, Lenin's wife, Nadezhda Krupskaya, delivered a document to the Kremlin that would later be called Lenin's Testament or Letter to the Congress. Lenin called out his colleagues uh, character strengths and flaws. Re regarding Stalin, Lenin wrote, quote, Comrade Stalin, having become general secretary, has concentrated boundless power in his hands, and I am not sure whether he will always be able to use that power with sufficient caution, end quote. Stalin reacted by saying, quote, Lenin shit on himself and he shit on us, end quote. Lenin also had words for Leon Trotsky saying, quote, Comrade Trotsky, as his fight against the Central Committee in connection with the issue of the People's Commissariat of Railways proved is distinguished by the highest abilities. He is personally perhaps the most able man in the present Central Committee, but he has displayed excessive self-assurance and shown excessive preoccupation with the purely administrative side of matters." End quote. Lenin warned that the two strong personalities of Stalin and Trotsky could have pulled the party apart into two different orbits and forced competition into the political structure at best, you know, civil war at worst. In July 1923, Stalin received perhaps the largest slap in the face from Lenin. This was the infamous letter that stated, quote, Stalin is too rude. And this defect, while fully tolerable in the milieu and company among us communists, becomes intolerable in the post of general secretary. That is why I suggest that the comrades think about a way to transfer Stalin from his post and name a different person who, in all other respects, uh, differs from Stalin in having only one advantage, namely that of being more tolerant, more loyal, more polite, more considerate towards comrades, less capricious, and so on. The circumstances may appear to be a mere trifle, but I think that from the standpoint of safeguards against a schism and from the standpoint of what I wrote above, about the relationship between Stalin and Trotsky is not a trifle, or it is a trifle that can assume decisive importance, end quote. Wow, big words from the boss man. But there is something important to point out about this letter. Historian Stephen Kotkin describes this letter as alleged dictation because the evidence is scant that this letter even existed. Uh, for example, the original letter does not exist at all. Uh, Lenin's secretarial staff made no record of it, and Lenin's doctors noted he neither slept nor exhibited a healthy disposition the day the letter was written. The guy couldn't write, let alone speak, so how are these his words? There is speculation that Lenin's wife authored the letter posing as Lenin, possibly because Stalin wasn't exactly the friendliest to her. I've read somewhere, uh, the source escapes me right now too, so sorry about that. Um, but I read that that Stalin once referred to Lenin's wife as a syphilitic whore. What would happen to you if you spoke that way about your boss's partner? 
Some of Lennon's inner circle met to discuss this letter. They must have all felt cold shivers down their spines when they realized Stalin already knew about this letter and showed little interest because his inaction showed he did not feel threatened. Stalin had enough power to deal with this. One of Stalin's colleagues, Zinoviev, who we'll talk about more in a bit, had the brilliant idea of trying to reason with Stalin. He wrote to Stalin saying, quote, Don't take it and interpret it badly. Consider it calmly. End quote. Stalin took this well and decided to um, share power. You know, he spread democracy throughout the Soviet Union and forgot about his personal grudges. Eventually, he actually moved to uh, America and uh, to run Ford Motor Company because he secretly had a hard on for capitalism. Just kidding. <laughs> but could you imagine? Uh, no, Stalin saw Zinoviev's proposal as a threat. Stalin wasn't interested in sharing power or being supervised. Lenin's death, however, would be a major turning point for Stalin. This yielded the opportunity for him to eliminate Lenin's inner circle within the coming years. As a side note, a few different sources describe Lenin's autopsy, and I think these are worth sharing with you guys because they're kind of crazy. So uh, the doctors found that Lenin's cerebral arteries, the, the major blood vessels in his head, were so atherosclerotic that when the pathologist tapped a surgical tool on one of the arteries, it made an audible, mineral-like sound, like tapping a bone. When pressure was applied to the vessel, it crackled. Just so the non-medical folk are aware, that is definitely not a state you want your arteries to be in. So it's no wonder Lenin was in such bad shape. So Stalin's main rivals included Grigory Zinoviev, Lev Kamenev, Alexander Rykov, Mikhail Tomsky, Nikolai Bukharin, and of course, his arch-rival Leon Trotsky. I won't provide lengthy biographies of each of these guys, but I think we should know the basics. So I will share who these people were, their role in the party, and their demise. Let's start with Zinoviev, since this episode opened with Stalin mocking his death. Zinoviev was born in a Ukrainian Jewish family in 1883. His family were dairy farmers, and he was mostly educated at home. He joined the RSDLP in 1901, became one of Lenin's closest associates, and participated in the 1917 revolution. He then became chairman of the Petrograd Soviet and a member of the Politburo. After Lenin's death in 1924, Zinoviev joined a coalition with Stalin and Lev Kamenev as a counterweight to Trotsky's power. But disagreements ensued because for a long time Zinoviev and Kamenev agreed with Trotsky's ideas that without world communist revolution, Western influence would be a threat to the USSR. Therefore, the Soviet system needed fierce protection. Zinoviev was reluctant to speak out against Trotsky, but Stalin supported economic policies Zinoviev just couldn't agree with, so he backed Trotsky anyway. This resulted in Zinoviev being removed from the Central Committee. Meanwhile, after prominent Bolshevik Sergei Kirov was assassinated in 1934, and we'll get into Kirov, he is quite important to this situation. For now, we only need to understand that Stalin used Kirov's death to initiate a purge of the party, the military, and Soviet society. And in Stalin's crosshairs was Zinoviev. Kirov's assassin signed a confession, likely under torture, that Zinoviev was part of the conspiracy to kill Kirov. The NKVD arrested Zinoviev, and the law permitted that his family, including his children, would face the same punishment if Zinoviev were found guilty in the conspiracy, which of course he was. Zinoviev was put on display in an embarrassing show trial. He eventually signed a confession confirming he conspired to kill Kirov, basically an admission of guilt coerced out of him under physical torture, even though Zinoviev likely had nothing to do with Kirov's death. I don't even know if I would put likely in there. I, I don't think he had anything to do with Kirov's death whatsoever. August 1936, Zinoviev was dragged into an execution chamber begging for his life and pleading with the guards to call Stalin himself. Then he was shot by the NKVD. <laughs> Next in line, Lev Kamenev, born July 1883 into a middle-class family, 
joined the RSDLP in 1901, and sided with the Bolshevik faction. He actually moved to Western Europe for a time to assist Lenin with revolutionary activities and met his future wife, Olga Bronstein, during this job, who she was actually Trotsky's sister. After the 1917 revolution, Kamenev lived in Petrograd and assumed a leadership position in the Central Committee. Kamenev became close colleagues with Zinoviev and, along with Stalin, formed the ruling triumvirate, the counterweight to Trotsky's power. Sadly, Kamenev's fate would be similar to Zinoviev's. He disagreed with Stalin on issues. He was blamed for Sergei Kirov's death. In fact, Kamenev falsely confessed to the conspiracy, too, after being dragged through a show trial similar to Zinoviev. Following his confession, Kamenev was shot by the NKVD in August 1936. Next up, Nikolai Bukharin was born in September 1888. His parents were both school teachers, and they made sure little Nikolai got a good education. He held progressive views and joined the Bolshevik party in 1906. And by several accounts, he was a good speaker and well-liked by his colleagues. Lenin even regarded him as perhaps the favorite of the party. When Lenin died, Bukharin was the leader of the right-wing faction of the Communist Party, if you can imagine such a thing. They probably just weren't left enough for some. Bukharin supported economic policies that were anathema to both Zinoviev and Kamenev. Bukharin didn't believe in the idea of world revolution and instead favored preserving the gains, as they saw it, that communism made inside the Soviet Union. Interestingly, Bukharin's economics became more conservative and even drifted into capitalist territory when considering incentive structures for kulak farmers to increase grain output. Even Stalin backed such open market policies, but in December 1927, the Soviet Union faced a severe grain shortage. Stalin needed people to blame and brought punishment upon the poor rural farmers for their shortfall. He also pointed a meaty finger squarely at Bukharin. Bukharin interestingly authored an article where he dismissed the freer economic policies as, quote, Trotskyist and anti-Leninist, end quote. He believed economic prosperity came from a balance between industrial and agricultural capability. Stalin disagreed. Because Stalin cared about military security, and in his mind, only industrialization would get him the kind of military he envisioned. Bukharin and Stalin had other feuds at work over other policies, which on Bukharin's part was a bad idea. Bukharin was removed from the Politburo in November 1929. He was arrested in 1937 and charged with treason. During his trial, Bukharin was defiant and proud, so the NKVD did what the NKVD do best. They took Bukharin for just a little torture. You know, just a little. During the next trial, Bukharin was strangely compliant and didn't fight much. Wow, who'd have thought just a little torture would change his mind? Bukharin was executed in March 1938. So who's next? Ah, Alexei Rykov. Born in 1881... He joined the RSDLP when he was 20. Rykov started as a Menshevik but turned to the Bolsheviks in 1903. In 1917, Rykov joined the Central Committee of the Petrograd Soviet, who would later be appointed Commissar for the Interior that same year, then Chairman of the Supreme Council of National Economy in 1918, then Deputy Chairman of the Council of People's Commissars in 1921 and chairman of the Council of People's Commissars in 1924. The dude was killing life. Too bad his life would be killed, especially since he had such wide experience within the party. Rykov was on the side of Bukharin against Trotsky when it came to more free market economic policy and ideology. Rykov followed the path trodden by Bukharin. Mass grain shortages meant Rykov shared the blame for bad economic policy. So eventually Rykov stood trial for accusations of conspiracy with Trotsky against Stalin. He was found guilty of treason and was executed by the NKVD in March 1938. So who's up next? Man, working with Stalin is like the 
the suicide booth from Futurama. You are now dead. Thank you for using Stop and Drop, America's favorite suicide booth since 2008. Oh, here we go. Mikhail Tomsky. He was born in St. Petersburg in 1880. The son of a factory worker would himself become a factory worker at the Smirnov Engineering Factory. And that has nothing to do with uh, Smirnov Vodka. Different, uh, different spelling. Different thing altogether. At work, Tomsky got involved in trade union uh, advocacy, which resulted in him losing his job. So he joined the Social Democratic Labor Party. He took part in the 1905 revolution and spent time in Siberia as punishment. He was freed by the provisional government after the Tsar's abdication, and then he took part in the October Revolution. In 1922, Tomsky was elected to the Politburo. Like Bukharin and Rykov, Tomsky was partly blamed for mass grain shortages in the USSR because of his economic policies. Tomsky caught wind that he was going to be arrested by the NKVD. And with this information, instead of being tortured and made to stand trial, Tomsky committed suicide in August 1936. And a final word on Stalin's main rival, Leon Trotsky. You might be thinking, wow, for a a Russian secret police series, there is very little on Trotsky. And my answer to that is, yes, you're correct. Trotsky was a significant figure in the Soviet Union, but being commissar for war, he did not necessarily have a leading role in the secret police. But my lack of talking about uh, Trotsky shouldn't be interpreted as him not being an important figure. Trotsky would be gradually stripped of his position and exiled from the Soviet Union entirely. Eventually, Trotsky settled down in Mexico City, and wrote critically about Stalin. Did you know Trotsky spoke English? Take a listen. I begin my short address to you in my very imperfect English by addressing my warm thanks to the Mexican people and to the man who leads them with such merit and courage, President Cardenas. When monstrous and absurd accusations were hurled at me and my family, Stalin's trial against me is built upon false confessions, extorted by modern inquisitorial methods in the interest of the ruling clique. There are no crimes in history more terrible in intention and execution than the Moscow trials of Zinoviev Kamenev. Stalin eventually had Trotsky hunted down and killed. For Stalin, ordering the NKVD to kill people was his equivalent of ordering a pizza. Hello, NKVD, where death is a guarantee. This is Stalin. Get me Yagoda. One moment. Ah. I like it. The slaps. Hmm. I gotta get this music after this phone call. Spanish communist and NKVD assassin Ramon Mercator infiltrated Trotsky's residence posing as a loyal Trotskyist. August 20th, 1940, Mercator met Trotsky in his office late in the night. Mercator had a document he needed to show the old Bolshevik. Trotsky sat at his desk and read. This was Mercator's opportunity to strike. He grabbed an ice pick and drove it through the back of Trotsky's head through the skull. Somehow, this failed to kill Trotsky, who shot up from his chair and fought back against Mercator. Think of the fear they both must have felt. Trotsky fought for his life with a gaping hole in his brain and blood soaking his collar. And Mercator, not expecting anyone, would not be at least rendered unconscious by such a blow. Fighting back the old Bolshevik with a crazed look of survival, no matter what. Eventually, Trotsky's guards burst into the room. They apprehended Mercator and beat him nearly to death. They turned Mercader over to the authorities, and he refused to use his real name, only identifying himself as Jacques Mornard. Trotsky was rushed to the hospital and died the next day. Mercader was sentenced to 20 years in a Mexican prison. It took until 1943 for the American Venona Project to uncover Mercader's real identity. In 1978, as Mercator lay dying of cancer, he opened up about killing Trotsky and gave a chilling account saying, quote, 
I hear it always. I hear the scream. I know he's waiting for me on the other side. Ramon Mercator was part of the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs or the Russian Narodny Commissariat Vnutrinik Del or the NKVD. Again, I don't speak Russian, so that's as good as it's going to get. It was July 1934 and a special decree abolished the OGPU, Russia's secret police for the latter 1920s. There was an air of hope of relaxation of such domestic operations. The OGPU's duties were, however, transferred to a new institution called the Main Administration of State Security, or the GUGB. If these acronyms don't make sense, it's because of translation from Russian to English. However, the GUGB was a subordinate organization to the NKVD, which was the secret police, although, interestingly enough, the group was much more pervasive. The NKVD controlled a militia of ordinary police, the fire service, and other offices not directly related to state security. Why was the NKVD necessary if the OGPU was abolished? The Soviet government deemed political policing duties necessary for the security of the USSR. Their job was to maintain that security, so they operated both domestically in the Soviet Union and internationally, both of which we will explore in detail. Like I said, their domestic operations included civil services, military, anything that fell under the umbrella of state security. Internationally, the NKVD was quite active. Agents were planted in Western countries. Murders and assassination were carried out. The obvious example being Trotsky. The name of the game was espionage. The NKVD was instrumental in stealing classified information regarding the Allies' Manhattan Project, so the Soviets could engineer their own atomic bomb to challenge Western power. We'll touch on that more in the next episode, too. During the Spanish Civil War, the NKVD supported the Spanish Republicans and the Communist Party of Spain against the Nationalists. Support included espionage, counter-espionage, and arresting political enemies. This was on top of broader military support the Soviets provided to the Spanish. But the NKVD had substantial resources, including about 150,000 special purpose infantry, cavalry, tanks, and aircraft. Incredible flex for a secret police organization. In terms of the number of agents, one estimate shows approximately 40,000 agents total took part in the arrests, interrogations, and tortures during Stalin's Great Purge, and that is a relatively short period of time considering the NKVD's 12-year existence. Who knows how many people worked for the NKVD directly or indirectly. In terms of dress, the NKVD wore Red Army-style uniforms. However, the NKVD's uh, headwear or their caps had a blue top, which was, to the best that I could find, a tradition of Soviet secret police carried over from the 1920s. The NKVD had three chiefs, Genrik Yagoda, Nikolai Yezhov, and Lavrenti Beria. We're going to look at Yagoda and Yezhov today and leave Beria for part five. So first up to bat for the NKVD, Yagoda. Genrik Yagoda was born in 1891 to a Polish Jewish family near modern day Rybinsk, Russia, northeast of Moscow. He had seven total siblings, and a year after his birth, the family resettled in Nizhny Novgorod. In part one of this Russia series, we talked about how Ivan the Terrible and the Oprichniki sacked Novgorod over fears the city was becoming a city-state rival to Moscow. Check out that episode if you haven't already. Yagoda's father was a jeweler, and his maternal grandfather was a watchmaker. He received a good education studying both German and statistics, but in 1907, Yagoda drank the Red Revolutionary Kool-Aid and became an anarchist. Anarchy seemed to run in the family, since one of his sisters, who was a practicing pharmacist, also got caught up in Russia's anarchist movement. Yagoda was arrested in Moscow for being a naughty weapons trafficker. During World War I, Yagoda served as a conscript. Sadly, one of his brothers was executed for refusing to serve. When you look at young Yagoda's arrest record, 
the the photo in his arrest record, he kind of looks like uh, Adam Driver. But as Yagoda gets older, imagine a balding Adam Driver with a Hitler stash. In 1915, Yagoda married the niece of Yakov Sverdlov, who was a member of the All-Russian Executive Committee, and he got Yagoda a job with the Cheka in 1919. Listen to part three of this series if you'd like to know why working for the Cheka is cringeworthy. By the way, Yakov Sverdlov was Yagoda's father's cousin. So Yagoda married the niece of his father's cousin's son. Tracing this kind of family stuff kind of scrambles my brain, but I'm 95% confident Yagoda married his first cousin twice removed, if I have that right. Somebody uh, DM me on Twitter or Instagram if, if I got that wrong. Uh, either way, that's that's gross. Different times, I guess. Different times, same amount of not okay. Yagoda liked his job, and he, quote, took the most varied duties up to shooting, end quote. According to his party autobiography, I guess he liked to shoot people. That's what that means, up to shooting. By 1920, Yagoda could sign for Felix Dzerzhinsky himself if Iron Felix was absent. By September 1923, Yagoda became the second deputy GPU chairman. According to Stephen Kotkin, correspondence between Yagoda and Stalin traced back to 1922, showing Stalin's interest in gaining loyal secret police operatives. Yagoda was quite useful to Stalin, but that did not stop Stalin from providing some support to Yagoda's enemies inside the secret police. But why is that? Perhaps insurance. One thing a skilled dictator should do is keep a close eye on their security or secret police chief. Even better is to have that chief purged every so often. But I, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here. Yagoda liked to live large, so he required a more than fair salary. And Stalin was willing to provide. Yagoda liked nice things. And... He had his residence remodeled at state expense, acquired a large dacha, and took meetings while stuffing his face with crepes, caviar, and washed that down with booze. Stephen Kotkin wrote, quote, More than 200 bottles of confiscated brandy and rum vanished from the care of one of Yagoda's bagmen. An even more notorious associate fenced confiscated valuables abroad in exchange for hard currency, nominally on behalf of the secret police, gave Yagoda a cut from his diamond business and procured fine foreign wines and dildos, end quote. For insurance, Stalin had agents report on Yagoda's instances of drunken Bolshevik debauchery. So Yagoda had significant experience in political police work, and his chance at leadership came in 1934. That year, the OGPU chief, Vyacheslav Menzhinsky, died, and Yagoda was appointed by Stalin to head the new NKVD. We already have an idea of what Yagoda may have been like after dark, and he went equally hard at work, performing his job duties with steadfast ruthlessness. He oversaw the Gulag system, which we will go into later, and he oversaw the construction of the White Sea Canal using the USSR's vast number of prison laborers. And he kept tabs on Stalin's enemies. Comes with the territory of being a secret police chief. Thus far, however, in this latter part of 1934, the NKVD had not yet ratcheted up the level of terror. But that was about to change with the death of Sergei Kirov. Sergei Kirov had one thing in common with my wife, actually. They were both born on March 15th, but he was born in the year 1886, uh, unlike my wife. Sergei had an unstable upbringing. His mother died when he was seven years old, and then he was sent to live with his grandmother. But shortly after that, he was sent to live in an orphanage. He entered the Kazan Technical School in 1901. While a student there, he became a Marxist and joined the Social Democratic Party. He took part in the 1905 revolution and was arrested. After a three-month stint in prison, he joined the Bolshevik faction of the SDP. Kirov did his part to overthrow the provisional government in 1917 and then commanded a Bolshevik military administration in the city of Astrakhan. And then he fought with the Red Army during the Russian Civil War. 
for his accomplishments, Kirov was put in charge of the party organization in Azerbaijan. Kirov was quite loyal to Stalin. And for this loyalty, he was appointed the head of the Leningrad party apparatus in 1926, and then became a member of the Politburo in 1930, where he quickly became a leading figure. Why? Well, unlike most of these guys that I've just talked about, Kirov was actually pretty attractive looking. So for my American listeners, imagine if, say, Mitch McConnell were president. Think of him what you will, but... He isn't exactly known for being particularly good-looking. In fact, he's kind of known for looking like a certain shelled reptile. To be fair, I'm not that particularly good-looking either. So, uh, now imagine that Chris Pratt is sort of a protege and potential rival to McConnell's power. Chris Pratt is, well, guys, uh, uh, he's much better looking than McConnell. So imagine Pratt is is a better speaker... He's gaining popularity in the party, and I think you know what I'm getting at. That is this situation, sort of, between Stalin and Kirov. Kirov was a great speaker. He garnered so much popularity and respect that when he approached the podium to speak, the Supreme Soviet Congress welcomed him with a magnitude and duration of applause that rivaled Stalin's own. Though I think Kirov's was likely out of respect and admiration, whereas Stalin's was out of fear. Do you think Stalin was okay with this? If you answered no, he was not okay with this, you are correct. December 1st, 1934. Kirov was minding his own Russian business at the party headquarters in Leningrad at the Smolny building, when suddenly a wild assassin appeared and used firearms. It was highly effective. Sergei Kirov was shot in the back, and the gunman, a man named Leonid Nikolaev, was arrested. Nikolaev was a 30-year-old man who had been expelled from the Communist Party, and it seemed like he had a screw loose because he saw himself as embodying the spirit and fervor of assassins in imperial times. Historian Ronald Hingley explains that a deputy in the Leningrad NKVD office, Ivan Zaporozhets, likely encouraged Nikolaev to shoot Kirov per the orders of Yagoda. Typically, The security around party leaders, like Kirov, was tight and taken seriously by the NKVD, who provided such services. It is unlikely that Nikolaev acted alone in, one, getting into the Leningrad NKVD headquarters, or two, approaching Kirov with a gun and killing him without the help of the NKVD. Yagoda was presumably acting upon the orders of Stalin, who merely wanted to remove his popular rival. Super sus, right? But jump ahead to 1956 for a moment. Nikita Khrushchev himself strongly suggested during a speech that Kirov's death was ultimately Stalin's doing. But this claim was never presented explicitly, and we will likely never know the exact truth. Whatever Stalin's level of involvement in Kirov's death, the assassination was used as a reason to launch Stalin's terror. This period of time in Russia is also referred to as the Great Purge, or Stalin's Purges, etc. There are several different names for this. Stalin and Yagoda took personal charge of investigating Kirov's death and issued decrees to enact prosecution and punishment, up to including death, for political offenders without due process or appeal. Nikolaev, the assassin himself, was put on trial with 13 other alleged associates, and they were all shot. Then, Ivan Zaporozhets, his superior, and several other associate NKVD agents were arrested and sent to a concentration camp, where they apparently received preferential treatment and were made, I don't know, I guess somewhat comfortable, at least until 1937, when Kirov's assassination was old news and no one would be really paying attention. Then Zaporozhets, his boss, and the other agents were also rounded up and shot. As explained earlier, both Zinoviev and Kamenev were linked to Kirov's assassination, and, well, we know what happened to both of them. I mentioned briefly a a, a law regarding 
punishing the families of political offenders. So I'll elaborate a bit here. In April 1935, a provision was made law that extended legal penalties, including execution, to families of political offenders. This provision included children as young as 12. This gave the NKVD insane psychological leverage over parents being interrogated. If you know your 12-year-old will be framed alongside your crimes, then you're highly likely to confess to whatever accusations are true or not. People could be legally executed for seeking refuge abroad, and soldiers who deserted their posts risked their families being sent to prison. In my personal opinion, I think this legal system of terror is partly why Stalin was so successful as an authoritarian. Probably other dictators did this sort of thing too, but if you're caught protesting, hoarding grain, doing something counter-revolutionary or whatever, the regime didn't see this infraction as an individual act or crime. They wanted to punish you and punish your familial or personal network. If committing a political crime meant putting yourself and those closest to you at risk, then you'd probably be less likely to do it. Just my own thoughts there. During Stalin's time in power, there really was little or, if any, real organized resistance to Stalin. There were opponents to this extension of the death penalty towards party members, but that only encouraged Stalin's wrath. And these opponents were also eventually removed. Now Stalin approached obtaining the death penalty for party members on more than one occasion. And was met with pushback, of course. For example, in 1935, Stalin's second attempt to put Kemenev to death failed. We know Kemenev was eventually executed, but at first he only received a 10-year prison sentence. Both Kemenev and Zinoviev were subjected to show trials, as we discussed. Uh, For example, at Kemenev's trial, the court was filled with agents of the NKVD, such as clerks and typists, who were instructed to jeer and haggle the defendant if he so much as deviated from the prescribed script. See, if you had offered evidence that you had nothing to do with Kirov's death other than your own confession to the contrary, they had a solution for this. More investigations by the NKVD, and by investigation I mean probably torture. And torture was a comprehensive process. You'd be subjected to months of physical and psychological torture, including sleep deprivation, bright lights shined in your eyes, beatings, and you'd be under constant threat of death. Not just to yourself, but to your spouse, your children, and others closest to you. Cooperation never guaranteed the NKVD would spare your life or the lives of your friends and family. What really tortured you was the uncertainty of it all. Even the torturers themselves lived in fear and had to be on their toes since not extracting confessions made them look like failures, which could subject them to a taste of their own medicine. The NKVD pulled a trick from the Okrana's playbook for the most stubborn prisoners. Agent provocateurs would approach people who just refused to confess. In the provocateur's possession would be a fake signed uh, confession of the prisoner's friends, uh, perhaps of their family or colleagues, uh, in order to show the prisoner they were not protecting anybody with their silence. Many were duped into signing their own confessions by this tactic. Historian Ronald Hingley shows the Trials and interrogations were orchestrated like a a theatrical performance with NKVD producers, writers, and set dressers. Just Just a very dark and bizarre kind of theater toying with these prisoners. And even the NKVD agents sort of toying with themselves. Really, it was the, the system that toyed with everybody. The executions of Kamenev and Zinoviev were unprecedented in terms of legally arriving at death for party members of their stature. This implied Stalin could do the same with both former and certainly lesser party members. Yogoda was then ordered to have approximately 5,000 opposition members languishing in exile or camps executed without formal charges. Resistance to party member execution, however, continued. On September 10th, 1936, it was announced in Pravda that both Bukharin and Roykov's charges were dropped due to pressure from other members in the Politburo. 
Stalin was getting sick of the Politburo's crap and fired Yagoda. Nikolai Yezhov would take his place. Regarding Yagoda's uh, removal from his post, Stalin published the following document regarding the matter, saying, quote, We deem it absolutely necessary and urgent that Comrade Yezhov be nominated to the post of People's Commissar of the NKVD. Yagoda has definitely proved himself to be incapable of unmasking the Trotskyite Zinoviite bloc. The OGPU is four years behind in this matter, end quote. So out with the old, in with the new, Yagoda is gone and Yazhov is in. Roses are red, violets are blue. The secret police chief eats a bullet too. So what happened to Yagoda? He was transferred to a new role as People's Commissar for Communications, where he worked for six months and hated every second of it because it was far less powerful, paid less money, and markedly reduced his access to fine wine and dildos. But that was kind of the point. Yagoda was arrested in 1937, charged with treason and conspiracy against Stalin and the USSR, put on trial, and sentenced to death. The Soviets tended to not wait to execute such high-profile figures, so he was dragged out of the courtroom to an execution chamber, stripped naked, beaten, and shot. Show trials and executions continued, and opposition gradually dwindled. Stalin's purges could continue, full speed ahead. And the architect of much of the purge was the new NKVD chief, Nikolai Yezhov. Yezhov was born in St. Petersburg on May the 1st, 1895. He apparently suffered from what the sources describe as a crippled leg. I don't know if his condition was genetic or due to injury, but whatever the reason, Yazhov was only five feet tall. He was a small dude. But with his stature combined with his apparent sadistic personality, Yazhov was nicknamed the Bloody Dwarf. The word dwarf being, you know, a sign of the times. Yazhov first worked as a tailor's assistant. Uh, he joined the Russian army in 1915 and fought on the Eastern Front during the First World War. He joined the Bolsheviks after the February Revolution in 1917 and fought in the Red Army during the Russian Civil War. Yezhov and Stalin met in 1927, and Stalin was impressed with Yezhov's ability to increase the frequency of grain deliveries from Siberia. It didn't take long for Yezhov to ascend to the Central Committee. Before becoming chief of the NKVD, he took Sergei Kirov's job as head of the Party Control Commission which monitored and corrected the conduct of party members who deviated from party norms and ethics. The Great Purge was initiated by Yagoda, but Yezhov went full throttle on terror and would see it through. So the Great Purge. Overall, the Purge or the Great Terror was Stalin's tightening of his power over the Communist Party, the state and the broader society in general. So here's some food for thought. Between 1933 and 1937, nearly 46% of party members were purged. According to historian Ronald Hingley, in 1937 alone, only 1.9 million party members remained of the 3.6 million members in 1933. The Red Army lost three of five marshals, 14 out of 15 army commanders, and all 16 army commissars. 25 out of 28 army corps commissars were purged, and 8 out of 9 admirals were purged, too. Given the size of the Red Army at the time, the proportion of the officer ranks eliminated was actually about 10%. Previous estimates had the total purged at about one-third, but those calculations didn't account for the total size or just, just the, the sheer volume of, uh, of the officer ranks. Historian Ronald Hingley provides his own numbers regarding Red Army purges. He states there were 35,000 officers purged between 1937 and 1938. 90% of generals were purged and 80% of colonels. So the Soviet high command was more or less destroyed. We may think of the USSR as being unique in purging officers shortly before the outbreak of the Second World War. But while the USSR did do this, they were not unique. 
Germany did the same thing, as well as the U.S. even uh, relieved itself of bad officers. But at least in the U.S., that meant getting fired, not necessarily getting fired at. Refocusing on the Great Purge. The Purge permeated Soviet society, culture, and intellectual life. Neighbors denounced neighbors, colleagues denounced colleagues, children denounced parents. Writers, doctors, and academics were persecuted. And the NKVD took all accusations seriously with maximum lethality. Remember Stalin's first wife, Cato? Stalin also had her family purged. Even his brother-in-law, who introduced them. In my opinion, this specific case seems like Stalin partly used the purge for a deeper, darker, and more twisted urge in his core to eliminate that part of his life like it never existed, or that he wanted to forget about, because now he was a different person. Some of the Soviet states had members of their politburos arrested and executed, like in Ukraine and Georgia. Loyal supporters of Stalin, who never questioned his moves to seize power, were purged. Communist Party members who escaped to the USSR from other nations were purged. You get purged, and you get purged. Everybody gets purged. The NKVD and the party were turned against each other, but the NKVD had the distinct advantage of being the tough guys who also happened to run gulags and carry guns. A high-ranking party member might recognize the beginning of the end when they are demoted to some relatively unimportant position like commissar for road signs, commissar for number two pencil production, or commissar for fine wines and dildos. I made those up, but you get the point. He would be left in that post for a while to stew in his own thoughts that execution would come sooner or later, but didn't know when. Another tactic was to arrest a high-ranking official's subordinates to send a message that they're next. Sometimes a party member would be awarded a prestigious medal on the same day as their arrest. A party member could receive the Order of Lenin in the morning and be arrested that afternoon and be dead by evening. Stalin's strangling of the Soviet Union into submission also included rooting out remnants of old institutions. Yezhov had Yagoda's most senior deputies executed. Many of these guys started their careers in the Cheka. The NKVD even cannibalized itself, and I sort of mentioned this a little earlier with torturers sort of fearing that they would be next if they didn't do a good job. But in 1937 alone, the NKVD executed over 3,000 of its own agents. Fear permeated the institution of the NKVD and the minds of its agents. On some occasions, NKVD agents resorted to suicide rather than being killed by their own comrades. Stalin relied particularly on three regional administrators to carry out purges. Nikita Khrushchev, the first party secretary in Moscow, Andrei Zhdanov in Leningrad, and Lavrenti Beria in Transcaucasia. Other regions had such ruthless administrators, but... The source doesn't mention any other uh, administrators by name, but does say that they were capable. In summer 1937, Ukrainian leaders put up resistance to the purges. They had recently witnessed the horrors of the Holodomor, which was a significant famine in the Soviet Union's grain-producing regions that occurred between 1932 and 33. The word Holodomor more or less translates to death by hunger in English. Yezhov grew frustrated with Ukrainian resistance and had Khrushchev go to Kiev with NKVD troops to get the Ukrainians in line. In January 1938, Khrushchev had top party officials removed and replaced with more loyal junior officials who themselves would be replaced in a couple months. Stalin also targeted communists abroad. Now, for the most part, British and American Communist Party members were left alone but German and particularly Polish Communist Party members were on the menu. We saw the NKVD's reach in their successful assassination of Trotsky. The Hungarian communist, Bela Kuhn, was denounced whilst attending the international communist organization called Comintern. Kuhn was accused of being a spy and executed. 
foreign communists could be tracked and hunted down because the NKVD maintained substantial espionage networks abroad, including mobile squads of NKVD assassins directed by Yezhov. Communists on Stalin's hit list were either tricked or lured to the USSR, a tactic that we have seen before with the Okhrana and the Cheka alike. Those who didn't take the bait to come back to the USSR were hunted down anyway. What was the ultimate toll of Stalin's purges? Conservative estimates from multiple sources put the number of arrests in no shorter terms than a number followed by six zeros. By the end of 1938, Ronald Hingley estimated that 12 million total arrests were carried out. About 10% of those were shot. That's 1.2 million people killed. The rest were in custody and concentration camps, forced labor camps, exile, or prison. Perhaps some of those in Soviet prisons wished they were dead. Imagine being a bourgeois academic Bolshevik, intellectually competent, but squeamish when it comes to violence. The NKVD arrests you for some vague reason, and you're sent to a far-flung, ice-cold prison where your intelligence means nothing to real, hardened criminals. You're with murderers or rapists, because the NKVD doesn't bother to separate serious criminals from political criminals. And now you endure biting cold, beatings, theft, and rape on a daily basis while the NKVD guards look on with indifference to your suffering. Just like Cheka-operated prisons, cells were crammed with more people than they were designed to fit. Newbies in prisons were made to stand in the spot by the overfull prison toilet, and they had to earn their seniority in the cell to get the window spot. Food was scarce, but what was provided was bread and vaguely flavored warm water. Privilege to the recreation yard could be revoked at any time for no reason, and cavity searches of the prisoners occurred randomly without warning. Torture was an officially sanctioned method of interrogation in 1937. Screams of prisoners echoed through each night, and when one returned to their cell, they were bloodied and battered with broken limbs and extremities. NKVD agents would use whatever objects available to them to perform beatings, chair legs, whips, or Will Smith's slap-happy hand. Really, any object would do so long as it inflicted pain. Some victims had their fingers slammed in doors. Others were permanently disabled or maimed during these interrogations. Some prisoners suffered more humiliating and bizarre punishments. I don't even know if you could call this torture, but more like um, something that was inflicted upon a prisoner. Some prisoners had their heads shoved into spittoons, which is like a, a container or receptacle for people's spit. And if I think too long about that, I'm going to hurl. Uh, other prisoners were forced to kneel while a guard pissed on them. And I really hope, if there is reincarnation, that the NKVD agents who pissed on people were reincarnated as fire hydrants by a New York City dog park. And that was just the prisons. Let's talk about the gulags. The term gulag is actually an acronym for the Soviet system of labor camps called Glavnoi Upravleni Lagere in Russian, or the General Directorate of Camps, or the Main Command of Camps. You get gulag from the G, U, and lag from the Russian words. It would be like if in America we called the Department of Corrections just DOC, or if going to the docks was a colloquialism for going to federal prison. Gulag sounds scarier, though, to be honest. Gulags were used as forced labor camps for political enemies, political dissidents, and other types of prisoners. Just to compare, a big difference between Soviet gulags and other um, infamous camps like, say, Nazi concentration camps was that Nazis used camps primarily for the sole purpose of exterminating groups of people. Gulags, however, were used as a tool of fear to keep the Soviet peoples in line to Stalin's bidding. Similar to concentration camps, though, gulags were a place of pain, discomfort, and death. And they were everywhere, 
Most were located in the European part of Russia around Moscow, St. Petersburg, Kazan, uh, but some were in the remote vastness of Siberia like Irkutsk, Magadan, and Vladivostok. Camps varied in size from just a few dozen prisoners connected to a certain factory to large industrial sized camps containing thousands of people. In Stalin's era, it is estimated that at least 400 camps existed throughout the Soviet Union. Each major city had at least one camp nearby. Sergei Weinshek, a good friend of mine, has an indirect but personal connection to the gulags through his grandfather, Cezar. Sergei didn't live during Stalin's time, but his grandfather kept the memories of his experience alive, stories that the family took with them to America upon emigrating from Moldova. I'm from a city in the north of Moldova called Bilce. Um city about 100,000 people or so. Um, so I was born there, lived there until I was nine-ish, um, about fourth grade. And then uh, in 95, we, uh, we emigrated into the United States. So once, you know, Soviet Union collapsed, we had the opportunity to get out and we did. And then when we came, it was, it was September 28th or something like that. It was right before Halloween. Now, when you don't know what Halloween is, stores have a lot of cool shit, all <laughs> these cool toys. And for some reason, and for some reason, everything is, is like gnarly and demonic and stuff. So nine-year-old me was impressed. Groceries. The grocery stores, grocery stores, everything is full. There's, there's choices. Yeah, okay. we came straight to Minnesota, and then um, we we uh, we had an apartment in Plymouth, and then we moved to Eden Prairie. Um, and I, I grew up there. Really, there, there was a lot to take in. You know, um, I was in fourth grade, so. There was there was an adjustment period. Some gulags served to imprison laborers, such as in the town of Magadan, where prisoners were made to mine for gold and other materials in sub-zero temperatures. Other camps just kept people within the confines of a certain area. And that experience was more like exile and less like prison with hard labor. Anything could land you in a gulag, criticizing the officials, being late for work too many times, or crossing any sort of line. Sergei Weinschenk explains more. I guess, uh, so after the, his dad came home for, came back from the war, um, you know, food was, wasn't very abundant. So, so he used to be a butcher. He got a cow, butchered it, and sold the meat to feed his family. And uh, I guess the Communist Party didn't like that. So Stalin had them sent out for being merchant, for be for for mercantilism or whatever. Think of more like exile rather than you're going to a labor camp or a penal colony. That's not what we're talking about here. I think he was in Chukotka. My grandpa and, and his dad were uh, had to go out to collect firewood, and it was it was one of those days where it was just like extra extra cold, you know. So they they went out, they they did their thing, collected their firewood, they had their cart full, and. Um, they're heading back and it's just, apparently it was just extremely, extremely cold. So grandpa starts feeling sleepy. And I think he was about 13 years old at the time, starts feeling sleepy and, uh, just kind of, I can't feel his hands and feet and stuff like that. So, uh, so his dad makes him, uh, get off the sleigh and run, um, ran all the way home, like however many hours that took. And, um, yeah, so when you know they got there, like his feet were like black, um, and uh, they you know slowly warmed him up and all that. He didn't lose any limbs or anything like that. Uh, but he was like, "Yeah, that's how I almost froze to death." My grandpa was a beast. My grandpa was hardcore. He worked on the railroad, but not like not like taking tickets, like actually working on the trains. He essentially like a like a train maintenance engineer mechanic. I don't know how he got into it. I think um really he it was because of the aforementioned Jewish uh document thing, um, there wasn't a lot of work that was available to him because he was Jewish. 
One particularly infamous camp was Kalima in the Far East, where prisoners toiled in harsh conditions for gold. Kalima maintained nearly half a million prisoners at any given time, but about 30% of those prisoners perished annually. Prisoners were crippled by losing hands and feet to frostbite, their sight from snow blindness, or their minds from simply going absolutely mad. And Kalima was cold, like negative 50 degrees Celsius or negative 58 degrees Fahrenheit cold, while forced to work in inadequate clothing. And forget about proper nourishment. Work effort was extracted by withholding food. If you didn't meet your quota, you didn't eat. So you had to try again the next day to meet your quota. Each passing day of this would make you feel weaker and weaker, less likely to meet your quota, and thus less likely to get a meal. Less likely to meet your quota, and thus less likely to satiate those hunger pains deep in your gut. The head of Kalima, Reinhold Berzin, was himself purged by the NKVD. He was tricked into flying back to Moscow to receive the Order of Lenin medal. Instead of receiving the honor, Berzin and a deputy were arrested and shot. You'd think these camps were too unforgiving for the most vulnerable in society. Children, but particularly babies. But get ready for another dose of depressing because many babies were born and lived in Soviet gulags. There are photos of new Soviet prison mothers breastfeeding their infants in these places. Women often ended up in gulags because of guilt by association with a politically deviant husband or partner. But women only made up about 10% of the gulag population. Officially, men and women were supposed to be separate in the camps, but in practice this didn't happen. Men often forced themselves into the women's camps in mobs. Gangs of men would ambush young girls and new arrivals in grotesque displays of mass rape. Both pregnancy and STIs resulted. However, some women welcomed pregnancy as it meant a break from hard labor. The NKVD maintained special facilities for the kids born in these camps, where moms, if they survived childbirth, were permitted some visitation. Women were not the only targets for rape. Ronald Hingley tells of one particularly attractive blonde, blue-eyed German POW who was attacked by a, quote, sex-crazed camp nurse. She used some sort of sexual torture device on this poor bastard. When he was found, he had to be carried to his barracks in a stretcher. Hingley describes another incident where a group of starving prisoners attacked an overweight female doctor. They killed her chopped her up, then cooked and ate the flesh. Speaking of cannibalism, one of the most horrific camps in the Gulag system was Nazino, or Nazinsky Island, Cannibal Island. Imagine you're a young woman living with your parents in a remote village in the Tomsk region, 1,500 miles or about 2,400 kilometers east of Moscow. It's the middle of the night, a summer night in 1933. You've always felt a sense of isolation in your village, but you don't mind. You don't even think about the world beyond. You just enjoy the fact that you live near the bank of the Ob River, especially on hot days like today. Recently, though, something hasn't seemed right with one of the islands just downstream. That afternoon, you noticed more boats along the island's shore. You've seen people leave the boats, but the island is so densely forested, you've never seen much else. But on nights like tonight, you can hear something is definitely not right. You're laying on your back trying to sleep, but you notice the faint sounds of screams and gunshots coming from the island. It's been weeks of this now. And your parents seem reluctant to acknowledge it or talk about it. Suddenly, there's a pounding at the door. Your father rushes to answer. Mother's right behind him. You hear your father exchange words with the visitors. You can barely see two men in military-style uniforms carrying an old woman who is clearly unwell. Mother rushes to light a few candles. Get up. They need your bed, your father orders. The two men, probably NKVD, help the wounded woman hobble to your bed and lay down. Her right leg is covered with a bloody, water-soaked bandage, and it reeks of rotten flesh. 
The woman cries out as your mother carefully removes the bandage. And that's when you see it. Her calf is completely gone. Just muscle and a blood-stained bone are visible. You look away and try not to vomit. Your parents gawk at the wound. Through tears of pain, the woman says, They did that to me on that island of death. She points at one of the walls that face the river, cut them off, and cooked them. The events that took place on Cannibal Island took place in 1933, so that was before Stalin's purges, but does not predate the Gulag system. The island was a great terror unto its own. What was the context for such horrors? What could possibly warrant such hellish punishment? Turns out you simply had to be a kulak. And a kulak was a relatively less poor farmer. Somewhat well off, just not as poor as the other poor farmers. Or you could also refuse to give up your grain, but it wasn't just stubborn farmers who were put on the island. Like the gulags, the island contained a mix of people. What was the point, though? Well, we talked about Stalin's implementation of collectivization, and the program needed some good old fear to incentivize the population. Genrik Yagoda, that prick again, in 1933 was still an NKBD deputy. Not yet NKBD chief, but it was his idea to kill two birds with one Soviet stone. Farmers needed to be collectivized, and kulaks needed to be punished. Yagoda's brilliant idea was to resettle about 2 million farmers from Western Russia, Ukraine, uh, places like that, with the best soil, basically, uh, to Siberia, and provide them with the tools to build self-sustaining collective farms. Kulaks and other political prisoners were shipped in boxcars to collective farms, a transportation method that many future gulag inmates would experience. For example, about 25,000 people were shipped via train to the city of Tomsk in Siberia. The Tomsk NKVD didn't know what to do with the prisoners. Instead, by Yagoda's genius, they implemented collectivization orders, but didn't plan the logistics for such an operation beforehand. And that's because Yagoda was probably too busy with his dildos. Eventually, 90,000 prisoners arrived in Tomsk, and the NKVD still received no support from Moscow. So the guards took matters into their own hands and loaded prisoners onto barges that would ferry the prisoners up the icy Ob River to Nazhinsky Island. Why Nazhinsky Island specifically? Because there are a lot of islands in this particular um, area in the Ob River. The exact reason why this island is, to be honest, unclear to me. The source says the island is about three kilometers long or 600 meters wide. So that's not that's not very much. Um, but I looked at different islands on Google Maps on the Ob River by the village of Nazino and struggled to find it. I, I think I spent like a good two hours trying to figure out which one of the islands by Nazino uh, was the, the cannibal island. But I did find it after a couple hours of searching. Link in the description if you are interested in the island's specific location. The Ob River itself is quite wide overall and serves as a shipping lane for barges. So barges dropped prisoners on Nizhinsky Island, and the expectation was they'd turn this lowland swamp into a productive collective farm. Instead, it became a slaughterhouse. There were no barracks or any structures built for prisoners, so they slept outdoors. The conditions were difficult to endure especially for those condemned to the island who were uh, previously city dwellers. Now they're out in the middle of nowhere in the sticks. Uh, by May 1933, the NKVD dropped off nearly 300 prisoners on the island. It was as if the NKVD was running their own sort of Soviet version of fire festival, just with a lot more horror. On the barges, prisoners were at least getting a ration of bread but over time, the guards resorted to just giving them flour instead. In response, the prisoners organized a riot. And in response to the riot, the guards withheld the flour rations. To restart the rations, the guards refused to distribute any flour person by person. So prisoners instead divided into groups. Each group had a leader 
and the the leaders were responsible for distributing the flour. Of course, the leaders were mostly actual violent criminals or psychopaths. Q tribalism, Hunger Games, Lord of the Flies, whatever. The people did try to escape, but the Ob River isn't exactly narrow, like I said, so many who tried to bail ended up drowning. Of course, the winter was not the time to try swimming across, and those who did make it to shore were shot by the NKVD. And the sadism of the NKVD guards should be mentioned. They enjoyed tossing food to the prisoners and watching them fight. Some traded bread for sex, and some guards ordered the hardened criminals to pull gold teeth from corpses. By late May 1933, the camp doctor discovered signs of cannibalism among the corpses. The doctor relayed the message to Soviet officials in Tomsk, but they didn't seem to care because they didn't increase the prisoners' food rations nor provided anything other than flour. Adding fuel to the fire, additional barges maintained their scheduled drop-offs of more prisoners to Nazinsky Island. I mentioned prisoners organized into groups to get rations. The physically strongest prisoners eventually formed their own uh, group to hunt down the others. With cold weather settling in, no food, and bodies littered everywhere, the survivors resorted to picking at the dead. Prisoners would make skewers from tree branches, cut flesh from dead bodies, and roast it over a campfire. One account I saw described how one prisoner decided to kill those who were close to death, but who were not quite dead yet, and eat them. Guards passing by the island on barges saw human meat swung from trees, a perverted feast swaying in the wind, waiting for a swarm of starving prisoners. One female prisoner exchanged sex for actual food from an NKVD guard named Kostya. The source describes how the female prisoner was caught being returned to the island by the guards. So the other prisoners confronted her, tied her to a tree, and cut off everything they could for food. Her breasts, thighs, anything that could be eaten. The guard, Kostya, actually found her a while later, still tied to the tree and still alive, but she did eventually die from massive blood loss. Things got so out of hand here that rumors eventually made their way to officials in Tomsk who immediately disbanded the island settlement and had the survivors shipped to different collective farms. Of the approximately 6,700 prisoners condemned to Cannibal Island, only about 2,200 survived. How do we know this nightmare took place? We can thank Vasily Velichko, who was a local communist instructor to the other collective farms up and down the Ob River. He caught wind of the goings-on at Cannibal Island. So he did what any sane person would do when they hear such a rumor. He went and checked it out himself. Velichko gets the gold medal for the proverb, trust but verify. Velichko arrived on Nezhinsky Island after it had been evacuated. So at first, only a handful of locals wanted to talk to him, but when he was on Nizhinsky Island, he only had to tilt his head down just a little, or take a whiff of that soylent Soviet air to notice the half-eaten corpses hidden beneath the island's tall grass. Velichko set out to then interview anybody with knowledge about what happened on Nizhinsky Island. He is the reason these details have been brought to light. His report led directly to the island prison's closure. Reforms were later enacted to abolish the use of resettlement collective farms. Of course, the forced labor camps remained. Perhaps not surprisingly, Velichko's report on the island was lost in the vast Soviet archives until they resurfaced after the collapse of the USSR. In 1994, when the Velichko report became public knowledge, a memorial was built on Nezhinsky Island. Now let's jump ahead to 1938 and see what Nikolai Yezhov is up to. Yezhov, like Yagoda before him, gradually slipped from power. The architect of terror himself would soon get a taste of what he was doling out. Yezhov had been demoted to commissar for inland water transport, but still had some control of the NKVD. Still, 
he had to contend with an ambitious up-and-coming deputy by the name of Lavrenti Beria. Yezhov's formal dismissal came on December the 8th, 1938, and Beria took his place. There are several accounts of how Yezhov received his formal dismissal from life. One story says Yezhov hung himself in the cell of an insane asylum, but was actually secretly executed. Another story tells of Yezhov confessing to being gay under torture and executed thereafter. Whatever the case, Yezhov was executed on February the 4th, 1940. The NKVD was not finished as an institution with the death of Yezhov, on the contrary, and the Soviet Union would soon be attacked by Hitler's Germany. A call of duty, the NKVD was made to answer. Interesting side note about Yezhov, there is a photo of Stalin and Yezhov walking on a bridge with a couple other officials. Stalin looked towering over the short Yezhov, but after Yezhov died, the Soviets used their 20th century version of Photoshop to make Yezhov literally disappear from the photograph. And that's all I have for you today. Let's recap. The Soviet government had a system that appeared democratic but was missing the vital aspect of multiple parties. The Bolsheviks were the only game in town, sending their own candidates to powerful positions in government. Stalin was a Georgian who went by other nicknames, like Soso or Koba. He served several stints in Siberia, committed crimes for the party, and was the editor of Pravda. Eventually, he would be promoted to general secretary, which allowed him to subtly obtain ultimate power and destroy his rivals. The NKVD formed after the OGPU was officially abolished. The NKVD had a ranking system and distinguished uniforms much like the Red Army. The NKVD was also kind of a paramilitary organization since they provided military aid and logistics support to conflict zones like the Spanish Civil War. The NKVD maintained their own troops, even spied on the Red Army itself, and maintained foreign agents abroad. They also provided personal security to Stalin. The NKVD also directly fed people into the Gulag system. The Gulags were a series of labor camps, prisons, or forced industrial operations throughout the Soviet Union. One of the earliest and worst was Cannibal Island, or Nazhinsky Island or Najino Island, located about 800 kilometers north of Tomsk. The NKVD chief position was not for the faint of heart. In addition to the normal duties of terror and fear, Genrik Yagoda and Nikolai Yezhov had to watch their backs and make Stalin happy. Yagoda didn't last and was shot, and Yezhov eventually made a mutual acquaintance of the Reaper. <laughs> Next time on Secret Police, we will explore the NKVD's latter years under Lavrenti Beria's leadership through World War II and through Stalin's death. Again, I split the NKVD episodes into two in the interest of time. So I really hope you enjoyed that one. Thank you for listening to this episode about the NKVD. Um, I'd appreciate some non-monetary support. So here's just some boring housekeeping stuff. Uh, please head over to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen and give the show a rating. Five stars is always cool. It helps support me and the show and helps other history nerds find this podcast. Even better would be a review. I'd appreciate that. If you can't do either of those things, at least share this podcast with your friends. Share the show with the people you love, the people you're indifferent about, and maybe even the people you don't really care for. Do you feel comfortable sharing this show with their, your teacher or professor? Um, you can follow the show on Instagram at Secret Police Podcast or on Twitter at hush underscore popo. DM me for questions, comments, and feedback. Uh, special thanks to the History of Suck It Velo Georgia podcast and the Eastern Border podcast for behind-the-scenes support and advice. Those guys are really awesome. Check out both of those shows, too, please. Links in the episode notes. Go out there in the world and please don't force people onto collective farms. Please don't have one of your employees reenact the reaction of a former employee you fired for the office's uh, amusement. That would be kind of messed up. Please don't send anybody thousands of miles away to an IC labor camp. Just don't do anything the NKB 
would have done. Agents dismissed. Americans have it so good, you invent problems for yourselves.